Matt, there was quite a lot going on in the markets this week. So as we kind of round off the week and this Friday, we look at what we heard from the ECB strategy review. It didn't make much of a difference, but they may have a communication concern coming up on July the 22nd. And then the other focus, of course, still yet again, inflation growth and the reflation trade. Yeah, it seems like uh, things are kind of on autopilot here in terms of the ECB. They can raise their inflation target if they want, but they're still terribly unlikely to hit it. And they do have Jens Weidmann at the Bundesbank saying they're not going to push for higher inflation than 2%. Take a look at what's going on in Asian markets overnight. There was no soccer, so we're all fresh this morning and ready to <laughs> rock and roll. But nonetheless, we see a lot of selling going on in Asia. It's not the huge drops that you may be concerned about, but if you look at the MSCI Asia Pacific Index over a year to date period, um, for, we briefly lost gains. So really not doing well compared to other regions where we're at almost at highs in Europe, at record highs in the U.S. minus yesterday. Um, you can see 10 cent bounce back a little bit up 2%, actually adding the most points um, to the MSCI Asia Pacific Index. Alibaba is still down, but not a big drop, 9 tenths of 1%. It is obviously a very big company, so that makes a difference on the index. And I noticed that, you know, the dollar, the Bloomberg dollar index, not moving very much, but the dollar is stronger against the yen, it's stronger against the euro, and stronger against the pound. So um, maybe getting a little bit of strength back uh, against some of, some of these currencies. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, it yeah. does kind of seem like the only place that you still have kind of that risk aversion is in Asian equities because, I mean, look what's happening here in Europe. It's the opposite of what we saw yesterday. We're clawing back at some of those losses. You have France, for example, one of the best performers, up 1.7%. You have U.K. stocks up 8 tenths of a percent, despite the fact we got growth figures uh, out of the U.K. today that showed that rate of change that everybody's concerned about is slowing when it comes to the GDP figures at least wasn't as fast as many people had expected but on a headline level we are higher today in Europe by two and a half percent again this is a uh, at least when it comes to travel and leisure now this is kind of my proof here that we're reversing some of yesterday's because travel and leisure and basic resources the two best performing sectors in the stock 600 this is a very cyclical type trade if that's what you're going to go in and buy today so dip buying to end your week making everybody happy of course we do have a German 10-year bond yield that's at uh, negative 31 basis points we have a lot of ECB speakers a lot of comments coming after that strategic review and finally a euro dollar that's weaker today we have the dollar slightly higher as you pointed out Matt it was higher versus the yen as well so that taking shape with the policy divergence in the US versus the rest of the world here we have the US you have a 10-year yield again coming back uh, is the sh are the shorts mostly washed out? A lot of the people we've been speaking to say no, they are not totally washed out. But with the yield moving higher, really dictating the move in the stock market, you have S&P futures and NASDAQ futures moving higher in your pre-market session, though NASDAQ a little bit weaker. Again, it's not really growth. It is a more of a value type cyclical day. And then finally, break evens. They are moving lower. This is the real standout here. So even if we're taking a break in this sort of risk off type atmosphere, for instance, Seen you still have break evens that are their lowest uh, in a couple months. I think this is about its lowest since March. So there are still fears about the economy, about whether reflation can come back. So sure, maybe you want to trade the reflation trade in stocks, but it fears that this picture isn't going to pick up is still rife within markets. Yeah, but Danny, that's the, the one thing that we're trying to figure out, of course, and exactly what's priced in. Also, mm -hmm. look ahead at what's uh, going on today. So we start with G20 finance ministers, central bankers meeting in Venice. Italy today. It's the G20's latest self-imposed deadline to wrap up global minimum tax talks following the recent endorsement by 130 nations of setting a minimum tax rate for corporations. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will also be in attendance. After that, she makes her way to Brussels for meetings with the Eurogroup. And then coming up in just under an hour's time, the ECB President Christine Lagarde and the BOE Governor Andrew Bailey appear on a panel discussion about digitalization as part of the annual conference of the Global Forum on Productivity. And then a data to round off the week coming up at 10 a.m. New York time will, of course, get U.S. wholesale inventories.
Now back to geopolitics and the Biden administration is stepping up its condemnation of China over Xinjiang. Now, according to a report, the U.S. will add at least 10 Chinese entities to its economic blacklist as early as today over alleged human rights abuses in the northern regions. Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran, now joins us. Enda, is this just a tit for tat or is this a turn for the worse? It's another escalation in the tensions between the U.S. and China, Francine. If you're put on this entity list, that means that U.S. companies cannot deal with these Chinese counterparts without permission from the U.S. government. It's one of the tools the U.S. is using against China, along with sanctions. They've already put bans on imports of certain goods from Xinjiang, such as cotton. This is all about U.S. criticism of China's human rights policies. China, of course, has pushed back before I came on air. They again rejected the U.S. allegations uh, against Xinjiang and, of course, it's cracked out in Hong Kong. But at the very least, it speaks to ongoing tensions between the world's two biggest economies. And another concern in China at the moment is the data, whether growth is still on track. We had PPI numbers out today. Do we have any more of a clear picture at this point? We are getting a hint that China's economy is slowing down. Like you mentioned, their PPI is cooling. It was at a 13-year high. It's now coming off on the back of a strong dollar and, of course, some government measures to take the heat off commodity prices. That will be welcomed by manufacturers. They have been jugging with very high input prices. But we'll get a much better picture next week. We get second quarter GDP data at the end of next week, along with figures for retail sales. And that will give us a fuller picture in terms of what's happening with China's recovery. Is it broadly on track or is it cooling uh, quicker than expected? All right, very interesting, especially as... Um, both countries start to really focus in on data privacy. To be fair, um, the Trump administration was pretty focused on this from the U.S. side last year, and now China seems to be seriously concerned about sharing its uh, big data, big tech companies' data. Bloomberg's Enda Curran there. Thanks very much. Let's turn to Venice, where finance ministers and central bank governors from the G20 are meeting. Top of the agenda is the 15% global minimum corporate tax agreed for the most part at the G7. French finance minister Bruno Le Maire spoke to Bloomberg early this morning about his plans. Let's be very clear. For France, we aim at having more, more than 15% for the minimum taxation. I think that we need to be ambitious. This is the unique opportunity that we have to have a fairer, more efficient international taxation system for the 21st century. That was French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire speaking to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Maria joins us now from Venice. So, uh, Maria, what are we expecting on the tax uh, minimum tax this this morning or this meeting, are they going to be able to bring it over the line? Yes, ciao, ciao, ciao tutti. And, uh, you know, Matt, uh, to that question, you know, on paper, everyone will tell you we're confident we're going to get a deal. But the reality is, you know, behind the scenes, when you speak to ministers here, this is a very complicated story, Matt. On the one hand, uh, the French would tell you 15% is good, but we want to take that higher. Keep in mind, there's no deal yet around the 15%. Then you also have the Irish who say we could work with uh, relocating taxes to the countries where services are provided but we cannot sign on to that uh, 15 percent and then also playing in the background here is the fact that the Europeans are also pushing forward their own EU digital tax next week for the Americans this is very difficult to understand you know they argue we're now finally getting to an OECD deal we're getting to a G20 deal and you guys are still going your own way so yes on paper, they'll tell you we're confident come Sunday. We're getting a deal on this. This is a tax revolution. But actually, if you look through the cracks here, there is still a lot pending and a lot of question marks. Maria, when you look at you know what exactly this means for some of the big tech companies, I mean, could they hurt or is it actually postponed in the in the future? Well, you know, Francine, what they argue is that to some extent they were ready for this moment. You know, this doesn't really come as a surprise. There has been a change in the global conversation around taxes. There has been a political change too, especially uh, in the United States. So they were they were to some extent ready for for this moment to have to pay more. And we are going to see them pay more to to, to that extent where you move perhaps from 12 percent to 15. What they argue is that in fact they welcome this move because it could make things less complicated for them. You know. They they 
preferred to pay one single tax across the world and not many different jurisdictions doing their own thing. Having said that, Francine, critics do say ultimately these companies are very smart. They know how to play the game. You know, whether they pay or not, 15% effective tax rate remains to be seen. They always find a way to reduce that tax bill. Maria, thank you so much. And thank you so much for bringing us those beautiful scenes in Venice. What a great backdrop. Now I have very intense FOMO for the rest of the day. What can you do? Anyway, <laughs> earlier in the show, I talked about how you have this kind of risk on, more cyclical, even reopening play doing pretty strongly so far. Pre-market, the stocks are that are moving to the upside certainly reflect that. Carnival up 2.5%. It's also trading higher uh, in its London-listed stock as well. So this is a sign that people want to go in and buy the dip after yesterday's pretty big fall. I want to give us a check on some of the Chinese ADRs in the U.S. as well because, of course, they've had a very volatile week. Didi actually up more than four and a half percent so far pre-market. Look, it's still down 20 percent since the IPO last week, so it's not like this is all clear, but maybe at just above $11, it's finally attracted for people to go back in and buy as we kind of wait to see what the political ramifications are between the U.S. and China at the moment. And guys, I, I had to do this as my last stock. I, I, I'm sorry, I guess. You're, I, you're welcome, I guess, but I did see pop. Chinese hip hop company. I still don't totally understand what they do or why it has the moves they do. But just to recap, this is a Chinese listed. This is a Chinese company listed in the U.S. that for some reason never moves like the other ones that we've seen. Currently down three percent pre-market. But I should say, Francine, it's still up two hundred percent since it IPO last week. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether they consider it a data company, and so sometimes it just gets kind of like bought with the yeah. other ones that they're, you know, trying to crack down on, such as DD. So we'll dig into it a little bit deeper. Definitely the story of the week.